to the Railway Series books long before its first hiatus in 1972, it spawned huge merchandising from painting books to postcards, audio records to cassettes, pre-cut model engines, and so much more. Talking of audio records, the Railway Stories featured storytellers from the likes of Ted Robbins, Willie Rushton, and Johnny Morris. But even before Johnny Morris was appointed to be the first storyteller for audio books, the real first audiobook storyteller was none other than Wilbert Audrey himself. He narrated the first two stories of The Three Railway Engines in a rare EP recording with a variety of steam engine sound effects. Then they went to the station. Where the people were waiting. Whistled Edward, get in quickly please. So the people got in quickly. And Edward waited happily for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. He waited and waited. There was no whistle, no green flag. Where is that guard? Edward was getting anxious. The record itself was pressed and published by the Chiltern Records of Princess Risborough in 1957. And additionally, it had become an extremely rare, and to most fans of the series, a real holy grail of merchandising and the history of the books. If you're lucky, you could probably find the chance to add it to your collection, but you'd probably only find it on eBay if it wasn't too expensive. Now, let's hear what the other people thought about their involvements with Wilbert on his books so far. I think I was a bit of a midwife, really. I think that explains it, because I looked after the editorial side, the production, the costing, the design, the advertising, uh, for those 26 years, really. My idea was, which I used in advertising in subsequent year, was this idea of small books for small hands. The idea of four stories um, in one little book was a very good idea in my view as bedtime stories because parents in fact don't like to go through 64 pages they would much prefer to go through 16 pages and stop the difficulty with the books really was the fact that that although their shape was extremely uh, unconventional the four and a quarter by five and five eighths they were extraordinarily easy to sell because of the single opening of each page with a picture on one side and, and story on the other. And selling these books to a, pub, to a bookseller in a busy shop, you could speak to them over the pictures. They didn't read the text, they looked at the pictures. Well, and Audrey was fairly specific about which way he wanted the engines to face, and so you were stuck with having uh, either the back end of an engine with no face on at all, or else some very peculiar view where you could just about see the face. Uh, but generally, it, uh, it was a fairly straightforward process provided I remembered which way round engines face on the railway line. Not to mention that the books were also published annually since 1948 with James the Red Engine until 1970 in which Duke the Lost Engine was published. Things were starting to get progressively difficult for Wilbert to come up with further material for the 26th book, Tramway Engines, and was set to produce a surprise packet instead. The plans for the 27th book of the Railway series, as titled, Really Useful Engines, had already been set for Wilbur to scrape through an empty barrel for more inspiration for his stories, but he didn't have any luck. However, his sincere enthusiasm for steam railways did not end there, for he would still be appearing in several occasions, including an unraveling event of Thomas Jr., at the Beer Heights Light Railway in Devon on June 14, 1975, appearing in a cover of The Observer magazine in 1979, as well as in several interviews for other magazines and later television, including one at the Bluebell Railway for a documentary about steam locomotives, where he met producer Britt Allcroft. Now we were moving to the 1980s, where a television series based on Wilbert's books was well into production. As for his elder child, Christopher, he was happily married with Diana, and they had a young child of their own named Richard. And much like his father had told him stories while he was bedridden, Christopher did the same to Richard, 
with the entire canon of the three railway engines, and his very first Thomas story called Triple Header, inspired by a driver's story of an incident while on a trip on the Neen Valley Railway with Diana on August 1, 1982. After that, Christopher started to become an ambitious writer and wrote the first paragraph of the aforementioned story prior to telling it to Richard. Gordon was resting in the siding. It was a hot day and the express had been heavy. I get so out of breath, he complained, but nobody cares. They just say, I'll be all right after a rest. Get the fat controller to give you tanks and a bunker, suggested Thomas cheekily. You'll feel a new engine. We tank engines never get out of breath, you know. Perhaps it was lucky for Thomas that poor Gordon hadn't the energy to reply. In 1983, with appreciated support from Margaret and Wilbert, who suggested to submit his stories to publishers Kay and Ward, whom he originally expected to wait a following year in autumn for the 27th book of the Railway series, which his father had never gotten around to write 11 years earlier. Instead, the publishers were quick to look for an illustrator to push deadlines in order to have the book finally slated for the coming autumn, where current Railway series illustrator, Clive Sprong, stepped in to fill Peter and Gunver Edwards' shoes, in whom Wilbert observes to be an accurate and consistent artist. The other two previous illustrators before Edwards and Sprong were C. Reginald Dalby and John T. Kenny. In the end, when Really Useful Engines was published, the Railway series was finally ready to make steam once more after a long hiatus, and making headlines such as, Thomas the Tank Engine has a new driver, and Thomas is back on the rails. Ever since the publication of the 27th book, Christopher played a very active part as a children's writer and author for many years. Here he was writing not only the further Railway series volumes, but the other tie-in Thomas books, including one of the exclusive annual stories and a variety of steam railway related books, such as Audrey's Steam Railway and the Neen Valley Railway, as part of a series of the nostalgic collection books. Now on to the subject of the television series at hand. After discussing with Britt Allcroft her suggestion to adapt his stories, Wilbert was willing to allow her to try in spite of having doubts over this decision. He had had problems with previous attempts on television deals and this one was no exception. Back in June 1953, the British Broadcast Corporation crew, or BBC for short, talked with then-editor for the Railway series books, Eric Marriott, to negotiate the rights to adapt two stories from the first book for television at the author and publisher's request. The first of the two stories, which was The Sad Story of Henry, had already been scheduled to be broadcast live on television for Sunday, June 14, 1953, with the second story scheduled two weeks later as part of the BBC Children's Hour program. The stories both use OO gauge models by Hornby, and the sets, designed by P.R. Wickham, were made to resemble the illustrations. In addition, the first story was narrated by Listen With Mother actress Julia Lang. When the adapted story was transmitted live from Lime Grove Studios, however, the reception did not go according to plan, even for both Eric and Wilbert who were stunned and enraged at the disastrous result while watching the broadcast. The latter was quick to criticize the problems with the jerky operation on model railways. The engine was derailed due to a faulty set of points, and then consequently picked up by a crew member's hand on screen, which he described as an elementary mistake. Also bothersome, the freely adapted script to fill in the 10-minute time slot all right, guys, if there is any other way to rhyme the incident with one taken from the same story, only with a few alterations, here's this. Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. The points weren't set right, it came off with a fright, and a hand put it back on again. Disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, put in James. Despicable. Finished Henry. But wait, there's more. Just over a week later, the incident received negative media attention and eventually made the front page of national newspapers. 
After much embarrassment, the second adapted story, originally planned for transmission on Sunday, June 28th of that year, was put on hold and finally reached complete cancellation. Please bear in mind with us viewers, there was likely no record of the aforementioned incident of the adaptation whatsoever, thus making it the stuff of mere legend. Almost two decades later, Ted Ray read aloud five Railway Series book volumes to be adapted for television in Jackanory, which were aired from September 18th to October 2nd, 1970 by the BBC. The series took place in a station master's office, where Ted Ray would sit down and read the stories aloud to the audience. A few years later, despite the 1953 debacle, there was a growing force of enthusiasts to try once again to bring the series to life. One of the legends of musical theater, Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, was a huge fan of Wilbert's books as a child. He wanted to produce an animated musical adaptation based on the series in association of Granada Television during the time. Kay and Ward were approached by Sir Webber himself, with a proposal for a possible adaptation. He had several meetings with Wilbert Audrey, and the publisher's managing director, as some part of lyrics were both drafted. Come take a ride with the eight famous engines, famous and faithful and driven by steam. Each one is run by the branch line controller, each part of his scheme the fat controller's team. Two years later, again, the project was abandoned, due to a variety of factors. Even Wilbert, still concerned over the potential Americanization of his beloved characters and stories, forged ahead and signed the contract, and collected the 500 pound fee. Despite that, the project was soon abandoned. Today, Sir Weber runs his theater company, The Really Useful Group, which was established in 1977 and has produced some of the greatest theatrical hits including Phantom of the Opera, The Starlight Express, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, Cats, and Evita. The name of his company was inspired by a phrase from the books, Really Useful Engines, that was used by the Fat Controller to see how all of his engines were being really useful. The Fat Director was waiting anxiously for them. Well, Thomas, I've heard all about it, and I'm very pleased with you. You're a really useful engine. James shall have some proper brakes and a new coat of paint, and you, well, you shall have a branch line all to yourself. Oh, sir, thank you. Back to Brit's story. After pursuing the idea with the publishers, Brit obtained 50,000 pounds from her local bank in order to be able to begin production in 1981. Various types of limited animation were considered for the series, including hand-drawn, cut-out, and stop-motion. These forms were still unappealing to Brit, as she wanted the world of Sodor and the engines to be as realistic as possible. The solution? Enter David Mitten, who had worked for Jerry Anderson on Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, Joe 90, and UFO and later worked as the director on television commercials, including the Ever Ready Battery advert. And after discussions with both David and Britt's ex-husband, Angus Wright, the final choice for how the series would be filmed was finally decided to be live action model animation, as quoted by Angus. You essentially play trains and film it. Other vastly creative people would join the team of the Britt Alcroft Company and Clearwater Features. Modeler David Eaves, cameraman Terry Permain, assistant director Steve Asquith, musicians Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell, and art director Bob gauld Galiers all strove to fulfill Britt's realistic recreation of the island of Sodor. But there was one last thing Britt needed to find to complete the series altogether. A storyteller. The family were in the family room and they were watching uh, television 
and I wasn't in the room and I was going past the door and I heard this voice oh my god who's that and that's it that's the voice and I went into the room and uh, Ringo was being interviewed on a British chat show I think it was Michael Parkinson yeah yeah I don't know if that right um, and I said that's it that's it it's Ringo and thus, Ringo Starr was a fine choice for the storyteller, despite his disinterest in the role initially. Starr felt children would be more attracted to modern stories, until he suddenly remembered telling nursery rhymes to his three children. Starr recalled having lots of fun deviating from the traditional story to further amuse them. A revised rendition, something like this. There was Father Bear, Mother Bear, and Baby Bear. And Mother Bear made some porridge, and a thief broke in and stole it. Eventually, Ringo warmed to the idea, and recorded his vocals for the stories from his home in an eight-day period. It was very successful, with only a modification of his first attempt at the Fat Controller, which was deemed too big and bossy. We had to redo four of them, because uh, the tone of your voice in the morning to, you know, when you've got rolling. <laughs> changes. I know, so just what you need. Hello, kiddies, it's Uncle Richie. <laughs> and uh, so we did four again. So it took about eight days. Starr later brought the character a more fatherly sound, which worked well for the audience. I think they express my philosophy. Uh, this world is God's world. You can obey him and get on, or disobey him and bring trouble on yourself. The, the engines, like us humans, they, they go their own way. They've got their own characteristics, and they try things on. But inevitably, they find that they, they've come to a sticky end one way or another. You are a very disobedient engine. Percy knew that voice. He groaned. The foreman borrowed a small boat and rowed the fat controller around. P -p Please, sir, get me out, sir. I I'm truly sorry, sir. No, Percy, we cannot do that till high tide. I hope it will teach you to obey orders. Y yes, sir. Percy shivered miserably. He was cold. Fish were playing hide-and-seek through his wheels. The tide rose higher and higher. He was feeling his position more and more deeply every minute. But the point is that they're punished, yes, but they're not scrapped. Do you see what I mean? All punishment has got to have a humorous side, a side of redemption. What are you doing here, Thomas? He asked sternly. I've brought Edward's trucks, Thomas answered. Why did you come so fast? I didn't mean to. I was pushed, said Thomas sadly. Haven't you pulled trucks before? No. Then you've a lot to learn about trucks, little Thomas. They are silly things and must be kept in their place. After pushing them about here for a few weeks, you'll know almost as much about them as Edward. Then, you'll be a really useful engine. Even Wilbert was supportive to Ringo's contribution in the storytelling role, and met with him several times in person, including at his house in Stroud with Ringo's wife, Barbara Bach. Ringo himself recalls that Wilbert was, quote, a very charming man and very protective of Thomas. Every time I called him Tommy, he would correct me. I thought the series was terrific. The fruit is in the puffing. The books are still loved by children worldwide 50 years on." Unquote. He admitted not having read Wilbert's books as a child, but was later impressed by what he saw overall. Wilbert declared, Oh, you were deprived. The series was officially green-lighted by ITV in the early 80s, though production ceased for an unaired pilot that was based on Down the Mine. It had simpler sets, flatter lighting, and much fewer characters. 
It is also considered a pre-production test episode. This was later refilmed, and Thomas and Gordon took its place as the official pilot episode of the series. Bob Gauld Galeers, though unsure of who watched the test episode, stated the response was positive. All 26 episodes were produced for the first series in 1984. On the morning of October 9th of that year, Wilbert, Audrey, and Ringo Starr were later invited on TVAM, a then-breakfast show on ITV, to discuss the launch of the series and the books in which the stories were based on. Um, I wonder if you could tell us, Ringo, the story behind how you actually got involved with it. Uh, how I got involved, I uh, was uh, the lady who put it together, Britt Allcroft, came uh, to the house one day and she said she had this idea for me to narrate these books. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> just trying to live myself up, folks. Um, and she, I'd never read the books as a child. I was probably one of the few children who was deprived of them. <laughs> and uh, I'm more of a Beano man. And uh, I read the books and I thought they were fabulous. You know, I thought they were really good books. And also the, the drawings in the book, the style of them I loved. And, she uh, convinced me that you know they were going to be animated in that style. You know they weren't going to make them cheap looking. So I thought it'd be a nice thing for me to do, really. Mm -hmm. And you are know? you pleased with the end product? I'm real pleased with the end product. Well, but Audrey, what do you uh, what do you make of him? Do you think he's done a good job? Well, I think Gringo's done an excellent job. Uh, your words in my mouth would go anywhere. It's a good departure for you. You know, it makes a nice change, doesn't it? To do something well, like this. Well, I've always sort of. I felt I've got on with kids. Mm -hmm. you know, I like kids. I used to be one. You know, the old <laughs> when you were younger, was that? Oh, yeah, a little younger than this. <laughs> <laughs> Later that afternoon, the first two episodes aired together to start a new chapter for the iconic Little Blue Engine. <laughs> 